है प्लस पाँच सो टूडेज आउटलाइन सो फर्स्ट वी विल गो थ्रू सम अनाउंसमेंट एंड देन लेट्स हैव अ क्विक रिकैप ऑफ व्हाट वी हैव लर्न एंड आफ्टर दैट वी विल हैव अ an important topic for your assignment 1 uh, which is PLPP SQL so for the first announcement uh is related to assignment 1 and the specifications has been released on this Wednesday uh, without uh, the PLPP SQL question and the full version of the specifications will be released uh by tomorrow and uh, uh and and uh, and together with uh, the, the the questions and the specifications we have also released some sample sample output for the for the assignments for the assignment questions and some of you may have noticed that there are some uh, minor errors in the sample output Uh, and, and some of you have posted uh, some questions on the forum, and we are fixing the samples. And the questions there there are uh, mostly they won't be updated. And and inside the assignment, if you have went through the the specifications, the current version of specification, what you notice is that uh, the first question is. Uh, Spelling question is a spelling mark, so you have two marks, which are almost free to get. Uh, so, so you need to format the your submission, the, the statements you have submitted. So, what I suggest is that you could use some some tools to do the spelling for you. If you are using some uh, some IDEs like VS Code. Or you can have uh, you can install some plugin to help you to do the formatting, and there are some online services that could do this spelling. So one of them is uh, called SQL Format, and what you can do is you can just copy and paste your uh, your SQL command uh, inside this uh, inside this uh, input box, and it will automatically format uh, the SQL for you. For example, let's try to do something here. We can we can use an example here. A equals to mm. so this is an unformatted SQL statement. And what you can do is you can just use this website. To format your assignment answers, so before you submit your your assignment answers, you you can use uh, some websites like this to to format it, and you will get some free some marks for spelling your submission. So this is this is almost a free mark for you. So please just do it. Just spell your spell your submission. And that's the the announcement about assignment one. And for the second announcement today is that we are hosting help sessions uh, uh, starting from this week. So uh, here's the timetable for for the you can find the timetable here. And mostly is is done on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So do you have any questions? Oh, is uh, is actually not. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a good question, and um, it's actually scheduled by the school. And I will I will try to ask uh, the school manager to about this, and see if they can address the the the, the time for for the help session, and. And the the last announcement today is that you should really do your quiz series, and the deadline is tomorrow, tomorrow midnight. And some students asked about uh, question three and four because they are related to uh, PLPP SQL question uh, functions. 
And however, the, the, those two functions don't require too much of PL, uh, PDSL specific knowledge. And most, for example, for question three, it, it is mostly just a procedural function. So, so you you should use your previous. You, you can use your previous knowledge to solve them. And another thing about solving the questions for the quizzes now, since we are learning some programming, and the quizzes, the quiz questions are about some uh, code snippets. So what you can do is you can try to execute uh, the the, uh, the the functions inside uh, all the statements provided by the quizzes uh, on your VXDB server or maybe one compiler, and then you can observe for the result and choose the correct answer. So so that's almost uh, a free mark for you. So just do it. Just do it. And now let's have a quick recap of what we have learned. Uh, in our last lecture, we have covered bag sites and their operators. So first, what's the difference between the concept of bag and sites? So what's the conceptual difference here? So sites actually doesn't allow duplicates, and bags allow duplicates. So most of the time, the, the result of a select is a bag, because there are duplicated data entries inside the result. So that's the conceptual difference. And how can we convert the result of a bag into a site? What's the keyword here when we do select? Yes, yes, I hate them up here. So distinct. The keyword here is distinct. We can select distinct, and then it will give us a site instead of a bag. So that's the first one. And we have also learned that there are three different types of uh, site operators. So what are them? What are the three different site operators? Uh, let me give you the first one. The first one is union. So what is the second one? The second one is uh, intersection. And the third one is except. The third one is except. So what are the differences between these three operators? So for union and intersect, it's equivalent to the mathematical uh, operation operator. So when you, when you do set operations in math, the, 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 the result will be the same. And for except, the order matters. So for, for example, for A except B means that the, the element should be inside A, but not inside B. And if, if we change the order here, let's say we, we want a result for B except A, then the result will be different. It's like uh, the results are the, the, the elements inside B, but not inside A. So for except, the order matters. And all the three different uh, site operators, they are producing sites instead of bags. So how can we convert the result into bags? So the, these operators, they will eliminate duplicates. And what if we want to keep? The du duplicate data entries. So, what's the keyword here? Do you still remember? <laughs> I see a lot of confusing faces. Uh, uh, the the keyword here is all. Oh. So, if we want to keep the the, the duplicates, we use the keyword all. Oh. For example, union all oh, a b. So, so so a union all oh, b. So this is uh, the keyword here to, to convert the result into back is all. And there are some some more concepts here. So we have also covered uh, the operator of in and exist. So 
what's the definition for yin and the this? What's the difference between them? Yin is very straightforward, right? They just check whether an element is in the set or a bag or not. So that's straightforward. So what about exist? So exist will give us a Boolean value. If uh, it, it will give us true if the, the, the uh, if the operand is not empty. So exist. So this is exist. And there are two more concepts here. So any and all. So what's the condition? What's the condition for any to give us? A result of true. So what is the condition here? So when will any give us true? Any any will give us true if at least one element inside the set or bag fulfills the condition. So this is any. And all all will give us true only if all the elements inside that set or entry or uh, bag uh, fulfills the condition. So that's uh, the difference between any and all. And in our last lecture, we also covered some more concepts about grouping. So previously, we have learned about grouping. So we can partition the table into uh, into different smaller groups according to certain attributes. And and that's the concept of uh, that's the concept of grouping. And what if we want to do some filtering for the groups? So what's the keyword to be used here? Can you still remember? Having yes. The keyword is having. And you know, that's what we have learned in some in our previous lectures. And in our last lecture, we learned a new concept that is related to groups. And that is called partition by. So what's the concept of partition by? So when is it used? What's the purpose of using this partition by? Partition by is also doing grouping. However, it is applied to every tuple of a selection. So, so it is used to augment tuples to provide group-based uh, uh, group-based attributes. So that's the difference between partition by and grouping. So, for example, in in, la in our last lecture, we, co we, we covered an example. Um, of uh, cities and temperatures. So we can use partition by to augment each tuple or each load of the table with the average temperature of a particular city. So we are grouping by the city. We are partitioning with by the attribute of city. And we are augmenting each tuple with a group-based calculation result. So that's the purpose of and difference uh, between uh, grouping and partition by. And in our last lecture, we also covered abstractions for complex queries. So sometimes a query could be very, very long, and it could have several, several sub queries. So how can we abstract these uh, complex queries? We have three different alternative ways of doing so. So what are the three different ways? Do you still remember? So, so the first one is using view. We can use view to store some intermediate uh, results. The second, the second way of doing so is using the from clause. We can select from a subquery, the result of a subquery. And the third one is using with. So with a subquery, the result of a subquery. 
as an intermediate result, we can select from that intermediate result. So these are the three different ways of de abstracting uh, complex queries. And, and the difference here is between using views and the two subqueries alternative is that if we want to reuse the intermediate result again and again m for multiple times inside our SQL file, we should use views. However, if we just use that intermediate result once, we can use from and give subqueries. But what is the difference between from and this? What's the difference between these two styles? The difference is that this allows us to do recursive queries. And recursive queries is quite tricky because recursion is, uh, is, is a tricky concept for algorithms. And the, but what is the scenario for, common scenario for using recursive Queries. So when should we use that? When should we use recursive queries? It is used to to traverse multi-level objects or data structures. So in, in our in our example, we in our last lecture we have shown an example of traversing parts of a computer. So for example, we the computer has some subparts, and the direct subparts of a computer are like motherboard, like CPU, or li like motherboard, uh, like microphones, like hard disk. And motherboard could have several subparts as well. It could have CPU, it could have GPU. And what if we want to grab all the subparts of of and sub sub part for parent part, we should use recursive queries. And for recursive queries, the the uh, the key concepts here are we have two key concepts. So first, we need an initial state, just like how we write a recursive function. We need a, an initial query that would help us to set up the initial state. And we need another query to update the state. And that will terminate the recursion. So th these are the key concepts for recursive query. And we have uh, in our last lecture, we have also covered SQL stored functions and procedures. So what's the syntax for stored function? Do you still remember that? So we can create function followed by the function prototype and the return value, the return type, and then the body of the function and language SQL. And that's the syntax here. And for return type, we sometimes we can return a custom a customized uh, combination of attributes. So how should we do that? Because that, because th that uh, customized collection of attributes is not a standard data type in P uh, Postgres. So what should we do when we define the type there? So we have two choices. So the first one is we can define a customized type. The second one is we can use a temporary type, which is using the table parentheses followed by a list of attributes. So that's the second one. And, and what about, what if we want to access the parameters of the function within the function body? So how should we do that? We have two choices as well. So the first one is we can use if, if the parameter name is given inside the function prototype, we can use the parameter name inside the body of the function. And if it is not given, we can use dollar sign followed by a number. And the number starts from one. 
So the first parameter is dollar sign one. So that's how we can access parameters inside the function body. And the last thing is about how can we invoke actual uh, start function? What is the keyword here for invoking uh, a start function? So the keyword is select. So we can treat the result of XQL functions as a table. So the keyword for in invoking start function is select. And the second concept here is start procedure. So what is the syntax here? The syntax is very similar to start function. The difference, however, the, the difference is that it doesn't specify the return type at the start. So if because because the purpose and start of start function and start procedures are different. The purpose of start function is to is to re return something. So start functions are expected to return something. And start procedures are not expected to return anything. So it's more like just doing some a collection of SQL statements. For example, we can do some updates, we can do some insertions, we can do some deletions with SQL procedures, and they don't need to return anything. So it is not expected to return. However, however, if we do want to return something in the procedure, what we can do is we can use the, re the keyword returning inside the body of the start procedure. So that's how we do return in start procedures. And for invoking start procedures, what is the keyword here? Please do remember, it's different from invoking a start function. The keyword is call. So for, for invoking functions, we use select. For invoking procedures, we use call. And the difference versus uh, uh, functions uh, I have just, uh, we have just discussed. So the purpose is different, and the, the invo invoking is different. So that's all about what we have learned in our last lecture. And our plan today is to learn PL, PG, SQL. And in our next week, we will have a big recap session on next Monday. I will cover, uh, th there are a lot of um, corner cases, a lot of problems uh, you have posted on forum. And I will go through some, some valuable ones and we can discuss them and we will have a big recap session on next Monday. And we will continue the study on next Thursday. But both of them will not Maybe some, some of the knowledge will be useful for our assignment one on Monday, but the Thursday session won't, uh, uh, won't be used in your assignment one. So now let's come to our main content today, PL, PG, SQL. So PL, PG, SQL is actually an abbreviation for procedural language extensions to Postgres SQL. So as indicated by the name, it is a specific language for Postgres. And it is basically uh, a combination of procedural programming plus SQL programming. And it provides us a means for extending DBMS functionality. It can help us do, to do a lot of things. We can implement complex uh, condition checks. Uh, we, can, we can do some complex queries. We can even do some compl complicated calculations for the values. And we can also have detailed control for the displayed result. We can do some error handling here with PLPG SQL. And the, there are a lot of details about this. Uh, specific programming language, and you can find it in the documentation of Postgres. And uh, now let's come to the definition of uh, PLPGSQL function. 
So the syntax here is sorry, is like this. So it's create. You can you can omit the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the all replace keywords here. So create function followed by the function prototype, and it's pretty much the same as how we define uh, SQL function. And if and we can compare it with the definition of an SQL function. And you can notice that the key differences are after the the S keyword. So the body of the of both PLTD SQL functions and SQL functions are just a single string. So quoted by the double dollar sign. So this is so the, the body however inside the body of the the PLTD XL function is different. We should declare some we can declare some variables at the start of the function. And then we it's followed by the begin and end keywords to encode uh, the body of the function. And uh, the last difference is outside the function body, outside the dollar sign, the language is different. We should uh, we should tell the SQL server that we are using uh, PLTD SQL instead of SQL. So that those are the differences. And here are some examples for PLTD SQL functions. And you don't have to you you don't have to know about every detail of the the examples here. And we'll go through the features different features later. But this is just to give you a quick quick impression of what are these functions like. So this is a function to calculate uh, x divided by y safely. Why use the word safely here? Because y could be 0, right? So div division by 0 is not allowed in math. So, so what we can do is, so we need to check if the y value is 0 or not. And and we can't do that in SQL functions because SQL doesn't allow us to use control flow or features. We don't have branches. We, we can't make decisions accordingly. So, so as you can see here, we can have some if and else inside PLTD SQL. So that's the first one. And, and the second example here is a function to calculate n factorial so so you can see that in order to calculate we, we can have some different approaches for calculating our factorial uh, you may have learned this in your algorithm course and uh, uh, for example we can use a for loop to calculate the factorial and you can see loops are also allowed in PLTD SQL functions and there's another alternative ways, a way of doing this uh, factorial calculation. We can use recursions as well. Uh, so as you can see, we can invoke, we can invoke other functions uh, inside one function. So these are the features. And the usage of these functions is very similar to SQL, start SQL function. So we just use the keyword select. And the last example here is that we is to handle the withdrawal from account and return status message. So as you can see, we can have everything com combined together. We can have if and else, we can have loops. And it's basically, so, so this is just to show you that uh, PLTD SQL functions uh, you don't you don't need to be scared about it. It's just uh, it's just procedural functions like what you have learned for C or Python plus SQL statements. So this is what you should uh, uh, take note of. And and 
that's the first impression about PLTBXQL. And now let's look into some details. So the first one here is about data types. So PLTBXQL allows us to declare some variables and at the beginning of the function body. And the variables and constants could have different types. So they, they can be one of these types. They can be of standard SQL data types, like char, like date, or numbers. And they can, we can also use some user-defined uh, types. And there's a special type called record here. Uh, we will learn about the details about record here. And the, we can also use some table row types. The, the syntax of table row types is a percentage sign followed by row type. And, uh, and you should specify the table name for that table row type. And of course, we can, we can also, if we don't know the exact type of a particular variable, we can use, we can reuse the type of that table attribute. For example, we can use if we don't we, if we don't know what is the type of the locations for functions, we can just reuse the type of the we can just specify the, the type like this to to make sure that the variable is is of the same type as the table definition. So this is what we can do. And there's also a special type called cursor, and we won't use it for now. And uh, we, but we will be using cursors for in, you know when we when we learn how to interact with Postgres with Python. So these are the data types. As you may notice, most of the data types are already covered in our previous uh, slides. And the new concept here is record. Record is a special type and is similar to a row style type. It is used to host the value of a particular row. However, the difference is that it doesn't have a predefined structure. So we don't have to specify the attributes or the type of attributes for this, for this uh, record type. And the, the va a variable of the record type is determined only when only when we use a select statement to assign the actual value to it. So the the actual structure of rec a record is not determined until we assign the value to it. So so to the 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 syntax for declaring a variable as a record type is like this. You can you can just specify the variable name and you can tell SQL that it is a record. And since it is like a, it is like the row type, it's holding a, a, the value of a tuple. We can access the field of that tuple using the dot notation here. And since, since the structure of a record variable is not determined until we assign the value to it, if we try to access that variable before, assi before assigning the, 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 the actual value, we will end up in errors. So this is something we should be careful about. And and now let's learn more about the syntax for the control flow features in PLTB SQL. So it's uh, so so the first one is uh, how do we assign values to variables? So the first the first thing we can do is we can if we just want to assign some constant values, we can use the notation of column followed by the equal sign, and and if we want, and we can also use 
uh, we can also select values from tables into some variables, and and the, and the key and the, the the operators here is select into. And for for selection, th this selection is different from the the select we use for SQL. For selection in control flow, or in the control flow context, which means that we are doing some branching. So for branches, it's very similar to other programming languages. We can use if, else if, and uh, and do note that uh, the the, uh, the 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 block, the if block, are are ended by end if keyword here. And another key concept for control flow is loop. So so there are uh, so PLTG SQL does allow us to define loops. And similar to other programming languages, we can have uh, we can have an infinite loop. We just we just don't specify the, the conditions for the loop and we can have while loops and for loops. So and it's very similar to the if statements. We should use end loop to mark the end of a loop. So that's all about the syntax of the control flow structures. And now let's look into the how we assign values we are select into. So we can store query results into variables. And uh, <coughs> And the and the syntax is like this: we can assign multiple values uh, with one statement, and and we can, for example, we can select expression one, expression two into value variable one, variable two. So the, you 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 may notice that we are if we want to assign multiple values, we need to maintain the correspondence between the variables and the actual expressions after the select. So the semantics here is uh, very similar to how we do a normal selection. So we just execute the, the select query as euro, and then we return the projection list, or the result of the selection, as euro. And then we assign the value of, of each uh, selected value to the to the variables according to the order, so they will follow the same order. And let's have a let's have a look at an example here for selecting tools. So this uh, in this example, we only have one table, which is called products, and each product have four attributes. The first one is product ID, and the second one is product name. Third one, the third one is price, and the last one is quantity. As you can see here, we have five products in our database, and uh, and the function here is we can create a function to we can create a function to get the product details. So the parameter of the function is just the ID of the product. And what it will return us, it, it won't, uh, you, you may notice that it, it won't return anything here. It's returning void. However, we can use this read notice keyword here to print out some results uh, into the standard output. So. Uh, this is like uh, print f in uh, in C or just print in Python, and we will learn more details about this uh, later. And and this function is very simple. It only have one uh, statement inside for now, so it only have one select. We will select the 
product name, price, and quantity according, according to the product ID provided to us. So, so if we run this program, so, so the, remember the invoking the program, uh, it, the program, uh, the functions are invoked via select. So, so we can select, let's say we select uh, the product ID, product with ID one, two, three. And as you can see here, the function is printing out uh, the details of the of the product, and and that's the basic semantics of this example here. And let's go through the uh, all the all the, 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 the questions. So the first one is, what will happen if we just remove the where clause? If we just remove this where clause for this selection for this select into. As you can see, we are selecting product name into the variable name, product name. Uh, we are selecting price into the variable product, uh, price. We are, we are selecting quantity into the variable quantity. So what will happen if we, if we remove the where clause? Because this where here guarantees that our selection only produces one row. If we remove the where here, the default behavior of not having a where clause is equal to where true. So it will return as multiple rows. So what will be stored into this selecting tool? So what if we just do this instead? Let's see. What if we just change the select into a form like this? So Actually, this select will give us multiple rows, and we are storing it, storing it, multi we are storing it into three variables. So, what will this give us? What will be the result? Uh, not exactly, but let's see the result. We can run it right now. So. We are selecting multiple values. Remember, we are selecting multiple values. As you can see, we invoke the function on different product IDs, but but they they are all giving us the same result here. And each one of them is only one row. So the behavior the behavior of selecting multiple values into some variables, the, the behavior of so selecting multiple values, multiple rows into, into some variables is that it will only store the first row into that value. So the first row here is laptop. And if we if we remove the where class, we will only store laptop because that's the first row into the table. So everything becomes laptop here. So this is the default behavior of selecting multiple rows. And, and, and now let's try something more. As you may notice, we have declared a type, a record type product detail here at the start of the function. So let's try to play with this record type. So as you can see, we don't need to specify what are in that row. We, we can select multiple attributes into the record type. And we don't need to specify the type of attributes, the type of each attribute. And let's see the result. As you can see, the record is like, is just like a tuple here, hold, holding the whatever, whatever attributes we select into that record. 
So, so this is the record type. So what will happen? What will happen if we don't do this select here? We don't do this select. We just try to print out the value of the, the record variable. So will it give us a now value or what will happen here? Let's see. As you can see, it is a now value. So if we don't assign values, everything is now. Again, let's try to remove. Let's try to remove the the weird clause. What will happen this time? <laughs> uh, let's try to see the result uh, before making any guesses. So actually, the result is the behavior is very similar to using individual variables. So our, our record is only to host one row. It cannot host multiple rows. So if we select into a report, and we are selecting multiple rows, eventually we are only storing the first row into that record. So this is uh, the behavior of the record type. And now let's play with the row type. So remember, we have also uh, the, the, we can also use the row type to to store rows of a table, and the syntax is like this. So. What will the row type give us? It will give us the it will give us something very similar to the record type. However, you may notice the difference between the row and record type is that we have to we have to select everything into the row. We can't, uh, we can't select three, these three attributes. So if we try to s just select these three attributes into the row, sorry, if we just try to select these three attributes into the row, a row type variable, what will happen? What is expected to happen? Well, we are missing. We are missing the product ID here. What will happen is that we will run into some errors of mismatching type and assignment, because a row type is designed to inherit all the attributes of that table. And since we don't have this, we don't have the product ID selected. We can't have the we will run into some errors. And uh, and and that and and of course the behavior of the the row type is very similar to record. So if we if we store multiple values into the row, it will only the first row will be stored. Only the first one will be stored. However, the, you may notice that the record type is much more flexible than row type. So, the the we don't have to specify the we don't have to specify the the actual structure of a record type. So it is much more flexible. Okay, and uh, and as we can observe from the 
from the previous example, the select into uh, statement have these two uh, have these two features. So the first one is if the selection returns nothing, the result will be null, will be just a null value. And if the selection returns multiple tuples, only the first row, the first tuple is stored. So that's the observation here. And let's have a 10 minutes break. That's the first half of our today's lecture. Let's have a 10 minutes break. You can grab some snacks here.
Okay, okay uh, let's start uh, our second part of today's lecture. So, so in, our, in our previous lecture, we mentioned that from the example we have gone through, we can summarize that uh, if we select nothing into the into the into the variable, the variable value will remain null. And if we return multiple values, if we are trying to store multiple tuples, only the first tuple is stored. And we can naturally we can use uh, if null or if not null to check the result of uh, of a variable. However, we can also use an alternative way which is a special variable predefined in Postgres to check the result of no, no data is found. And the special variable is named as found. This found variable is a, is a special one. It, it is local to each function. And it is, it is set to false at the start of the function. And it is set to true if the select if the the select statement before this before using this value returns at least one tuple and and it could this the value of this variable could also be affected by other statements like update insert and delete so if insert delete or update affects at least one row then this from variable is also set to true. Otherwise, this value will remain false. So this is the behavior of this variable. And let's have a look at an example here. So this is, we are using the same table as our previous example. So The table is, uh, is about storing some products of uh, digital devices. And we have the same, we have the same, uh, we have the same function, very, a very similar function to print out the details of a given product for a for product ID. However, this time, instead of printing out the details of one product, we print out the details of two products given their product IDs. And, and if the first one, if the first if the first product is found, we will say something about the details. If it is not found, we just tell the user that it is not found. And and you may notice that we don't need to declare this variable found anywhere. It is just, uh, as, uh, it is just uh, a system level variable. And you can see we can, do the thing, we can do the same thing for the second statement. And we will use exactly the same variable here, which is found. So we use the found variable twice. And Let's have a look at the, the data we have stored in the in the in the table. So we have stored five items. So product ID one to five are valid, and any product ID larger than five is not valid. So let's try to find out. Let's try to execute the function with product ID 1 and 2 and see what are the results. So since, since, product, since product ID is with within the, uh, the range of 1 to 5 is valid, both, of the, uh, both 1 and 2 are valid here. So we can see that the details are printed out as expected.
So what will happen if we select 216? What will happen? If we select 216, since since we only have five items, and the ID ID is a special is a special uh, type here. It's a stereotype. It's automatically uh, into it's uh, automatically maintained uh, stereo number by post price. It starts from one. So so this PID six is not valid. It's not a valid product ID. And the second, the second selection will give us, will select no item. So, so this is the result here. So because two is valid, we can select something for two. And then found is set to true. At the start, at the at the start of the function, found is false by default. And and it, and after the selection of the first product ID, it is set to true. So we can print out the detail of that product. And after the after the second selection, it is set to false again. Automatically by post price. So so the second, the result of the second uh, print is like this: no product found. So this is the behavior of found here. And let's see, and let's try to see another example. Let's let's try to make the first product invalid. So what will be this? The result here. So it's very straightforward, actually. So it's like the first one is is not found, and the second one it will be printed out the details of the second one. So the the procedure here, however, if you think about the procedure, is is like this. So at the start, found is set to false. After the first selection, it remains at false, and after the second selection. Since we have found one product with the ID one, found is set to true automatically, and we can print out the we will go 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 into this branch here. So that's the mechanism of found. And 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 sometimes in uh, SQL functions, we need to return multiple values. So, so it's very similar to uh, SQL fun a TLTD SQL function is very similar to SQL function in terms of the behavior of returning. So, we can specify the return type as using the keyword setup to make sure that to 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 indicate that. Uh, return type is a multi-value, multiple-value uh, uh, type. So, so for multiple-value type, we can have set of atomic types. So we can return a set of or integers. We can return a set of types, or we can return a set of couple values. Uh, for example, we can return a set of uh, a customized uh, type of tuples. So this is for returning multiple valued uh, results. So this is like this is essentially the same as SQL function. So and another thing to notice here is uh, called insert returning. So sometimes sometimes um, we want to return we want to capture what what has been inserted into the database. So what we will do is. We can use returning after the insert into. So this will give us the result of. This will help help us to store 
what has been in, uh, what has been uh, stored or inserted into the database. So this helps us to save one query statement because we don't need to we don't need to carry what we have just inserted. So that's a uh, that's that's quite redundant. So so we can use this insert returning to avoid uh, the, the redundant uh, queries here. And as you may have noticed with all these examples, uh, th there are some mechanisms that you should be aware of. Um, so PLPGSQL doesn't provide a wide range of uh, I.O. facilities, uh, except that we can use a read notice to print out something to the screen. Uh, it, is, it is like a print or printf in other languages. And, and functions are not syntax checked when they are loaded into the database. They are, they are syntax, the, the syntax is only checked when you execute that function. That's something you should take note of. And sometimes the error message are uh, quite ambiguous and functions are design, defined as strings. Both SQL functions and PLPGSQL functions are stored as string put uh, wrapped, wrapped by the double dollar sign. So this means that sometimes if you want to change the scope of a variable, it could be tricky. And giving uh, and some another thing to notice here is that sometimes you may you may have declared the variable name to have the same name as some attributes from the table. So you should uh, you should adopt some conventions to dis to distinguish uh, attributes and variables, function variables. So what you can do is you can try to start uh, all parameter of variable names with an underscore, or maybe you, you can just use a small letter V to denote that it is a variable, it is not an uh, attribute. So this is something you should take note of. And in summary, uh, debugging PL PGXL functions could be very, very tricky. And you may experience a lot of bugs to debug when, when you do assignment one. So let's go through how you should debug uh, your program, your PLCG SQL function. So, so uh, we we don't we don't use the debugger here, and we can sometimes print out some information of some variables, some suspicious variables, uh, when you do the debugging here. So, so here are some approaches for printing out debugging outputs. So, what you can do is you can use a uh, read notice. Uh, like what we have shown in our previous example. And the read notice syntax is like this. Read, uh, the two keywords here are read notice, followed by the format string and a list of values. Uh, so this is an example here. So we can, we can use percentage sign as Place holders for the variables for this format string. So it's very straightforward. It, it, this is not as complex as uh, the format strings in C. So you just need to use percentage sign here as place holders. And the order of the, of the variables uh, in the list matters here. So this is how you should uh, use read notice. And when you do debugging, you can just use this notice to print out some intermediate uh, values of the variables. And also, PLPGSQL also su supports exception handling uh, via this syntax. So we can use the keyword begin uh, to do some to wrap uh, the, the the some statements 
and then followed by the exception handling part. So for each ex exception type, we can use a when followed by then uh, syntax here to, to declare the, the, the corresponding uh, uh, exception handlers. Each exceptions, uh, each exception here is an or list of exception names, and there are some predefined exception names. For example, division by zero, floating point exception, and and some others. So you can find the list of all supported exceptions in the official documentation of Postgres. So this is what happens when an exception occurs. So the control flow is transferred to the relevant exception handling code and specified by the when then clause. And our database changes so far in after this began are unbound. This is important. So so if an exception happens, all the all the statements are unbound in this transaction. And our function variables will return their current values. At, at the moment of the, the, the occurrence of the, the, the exception. So the, the function variables will return the value. And handlers, and after that, the handlers will just execute and and the function will exit. And if there's no there's no handler in the current scope, this behavior is similar to many other programming languages. So if no handler is in the current scope, the the, the exception will be passed to the next outer level. Uh, outer level. So so the default the default exception handler of Postgres uh, if you don't specify anything, it, it will just exit and lock the error. So that's the exceptions. And we can, instead of, instead of passively capturing um, the default, the default exceptions, we can also read exceptions, just like other programming languages. We can read exceptions. And we can read different, and this read operator can help us to to log to keep a log at different levels. For example, we can read debug one, we can read notice, we can read exceptions. Read notice is just a special case here, which can be which can be printed out to the user. So. There are different levels of severity. So the level, the leveling of the log is like this. However, not all severities will generate a message to be printed out onto the terminal. So print notice it will be printed out, and all of the all of the read. Uh, notices or information will be stored in one place in this folder here, in a PDFL folder, uh, the subfolder called log. So let's have a look at the uh, example here. We're playing with exceptions. So we are reusing the same table again. And we store five items into the table. So this time, instead of getting some details, let's try to update the product with the function. So here in this function, this function accepts two parameters. So the first one is the product ID, which will specify the, the product we would like to update. And then the second one is a new price for that product. So we just we just specify a new price that we should put into that product. So, so we can we can inside the function we can just use we can just use uh, an update statement 
here like this. And and we, we are using the sponge variable here. So if the update doesn't affect any row, we will go into this if the ground the, the, the control flow goes into this if it will raise an exception. It will raise an exception here called this. And inside the exception handling part, if we capture any exception, it will be handled in this part. And since we are using a customized exception, we use others, the keyword others, to capture it. So we will, this time we will raise a notice to print out an error message to the user. So let's try to observe for the results for the first one here. So what will happen if we run the program like this? So we, we update the first product and we will update its price to uh, 1,250. So since, since the product ID is valid, so this update here will affect exactly one row. And uh, since it, it's, it's affecting more than zero rows, so this font here is false and not found is true. So we won't go into this exception here. And the product will be updated. So, so remember initially the first product, is, which is the laptop, has the price of uh, 1,000, uh, 20, uh, 1,200. And, uh, and let's see the, the result here. So we can see that the function has been executed successfully, and the result and the table value is affected. So this is this is how the function works. And let's try to play with some variations. So what will this function call give us? So this time we are trying to update the product with ID 999. So what will this, what will happen this time? Since 999 is out of the product ID range, let's, let's observe for the behavior first. So we will see that our customized error message has been printed out. Let's go through the, the flow here. So 999 is not a valid, it's not a valid product ID. Therefore, this update is affecting zero rows. And according to the behavior of font, the value of font will remain false. And not found is true. So we go into this branch here, and an exception is raised. And not every severity level is printed out to the, to the screen. And it, it's actually according to some configurations. And by default, it's not printed, the exception level is not printed out. Therefore, we see nothing about this raise here on our screen. We can see we can see that we only have one raise printed out. And that is where this exception is captured. So since we are reading an exception, exception here, we, have, we will capture it here. And we will print out the error message with the notice here. So this is the flow of execution in this example. And let's do another variation quickly. 
to, to see how it works exactly. So, do you think do you think anything will be affected by this? Actually, no, right? Because we are updating nothing. So this is uh, the first example. And uh, let's have a look at another example here. So in this time, we we modify the function a bit. So we update the product pro the product pro uh, price and divide divide the uh, price. So this time, this function accepts three parameters: product ID, the new price, and the divisor. And the new price is calculated as the, new, the, the, the provided new price divided by the divisor. So, and then we set the previous price of that, of that product uh, as the, new, uh, the newly calculated price. And, and, the, and, and if, if we are up, uh, updating no product, we will raise an exception here. However, this time in the exception handling, since the divisor could be zero, we are handling multiple different types of exceptions. There is a risk that it could be zero. So there is a risk of having the division by zero exception here. So we capture it. It is a default. It is a default one provided by post price. And we can capture this, um, this exception here with another one clause. And we can capture our customized uh, exceptions with the other other keywords here. So let's try to observe the behavior of this function. So what do you expect to see if we execute the function like this? The first one, the first parameter is the product ID. The second one is the new price. The third one is the divisor. So what do you expect to see? Actually, it's, it's very, very, very straightforward. It, it will print out division by zero error. And let's try to remove the red print. Yes. It will print out the, the division by zero attempt. And nothing is affected. As you can see, if we select the first ID, the ID with the ID of the laptop, the price is not affected because because remember everything is undone when we do when when, our, when every statement is undone in that transaction when we when an exception occurs, so it won't affect the actual data in the database. So if an exception happens like this it won't affect the final result. You see the price is still the same. And let's try to change the zero to one, or maybe to two. So what is the expected result here? This time is we are using we are using the twelve and a half uh, hundred to divide uh, to divide two, so this this time it it is a valid calculation, and it will update the result. As you can see, the result since the function is successfully executed, the result is affected. The actual data is affected. So this is the behavior of exceptions here. And what will happen in this? 
what what do we expect for this invoke uh, for 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 this uh, function here for, for this function invoking here? So v two is valid, and this price value is also valid, but this time they are updating an invalid product. So what will happen? It's also very very straightforward. As you could expect, mm, since this update is affecting no rows, and found is set to false, not found is true, and we will go into this branch, we will raise an exception here, and it will be captured by others because uh, because it is not a division by zero. So the expected result is we will end up in a unexpected error occurred, like this, followed by our customized error message. So this is what will happen for the second uh, invoking here. And this example is actually very, very similar. What we, what we ju have just done now is very similar to question, uh, question three and four in your quiz theory. So you are not you are not asked to write a function. You are just asked to expect uh, to to predict the result of some function. So what you can do is instead of just sitting there and trying to think about oh, what will be printed out, what will be the result, you can try out on your own SQL servers. You can try out the quiz questions and see what are the results. You can observe for the results. So you don't have to. You don't have to really think about them. You, you can try them out. So that's uh, that covers uh, the behaviors of exceptions and exception handling. And our last topic is about handling query results in PLTB SQL. So, so sometimes, uh, actually most of the times. Uh, the queries will return multiple values as the result, multiple rows. And how can we handle? The m how can we try to traverse the list of the results? Actually, we can use a uh, for loop here. And this is how we do this for loop. So first, we need to de we need to declare a variable. Uh, to traverse the the results, so and and then we can use that variable in the for after the for keyword here to access each tuple of a query, and then we can do something inside the loop. So that's the basic syntax here, and something there uh, the, the the key thing you have you should take note of is that the type of the variable should match the query result. However, however, there's a special case. If if we declare the, the, the type of the of the variable as as a record type, we don't need to worry about that. It is dynamically uh, uh, it is dynamically determined during the uh, during the after we, we have done the query. So that's something you should take note of. And let's have a look at an example here. So this time we are using a different uh, table. We are using the employee table. And each employee has an employee ID, has a name, and a salary. So this, this time we have a function to, to count the number of well-paid well -paid, uh, employees. And how do we define well paid? So we we assign we use a user user specified parameter called minimum sa um, min, min salary to de if if the value of the sal if the salary of an employee is larger than this mean salary, it means that uh, that employee is well paid, and we will count that employee in. So. So, for example, we can set the bar of the well-paid uh, to be 60k. 
all we can set it to be a 80k and we can count the number of well-paid employees accordingly and in this case in this function here uh, we have a f we can use we can use a tuple with the uh, a tuple variable with the type of record to access the result of this select here. So for each this this means for each tuple of the select result, we 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 do something. We do we, we apply the statements here. So we can for each tuple of name and salary from, from employees, we can check if the salary is larger than the specified bar. If it is larger, then we can we increase the counter here. And finally, we can return the counter to see how many employees are well paid. So let's try to run, run this function and see what are the results. So for six, if we set the bar to be 60k, and remember it's, it's larger than, not larger than or equal to. So, so five, five employees should be counted as well paid. And if, if we set the bar to be 80k, only two employees should be counted as well paid. So, so the, the, the expected result should be five and two. Uh, let's run the program here. As, as expected, it, it, it gives us five and two. And, and uh, however, this function is not optimized. This function is not optimized. Can, can we try to optimize this function a bit um, to see it can if to, to see if we can remove the if check here? Can we remove this if check here? This is kind of redundant actually. Can we remove it? The hint is we can use via clause. You can think about it, and I will show you the answer. So the answer is, we can move this check from the, because P PL, PG, SQL is a combination of a procedure language and procedure programming and SQL programming. So we can, we can remove the, the check in the procedure part and put it into the SQL part. So let's th let's try to move it from the from the procedural programming part into our SQL part. We don't need to do the check in the loop. Instead, we can use the where clause to filter out some tuples. So what we can do is we we can select where the salary is. We can only select the employees whose salary are larger than the mean salary there. So this is what we can do. And we can remove the if redundant if condition. So this will essentially give us the same result. So as you can see, we can we can flexibly con transfer logic from SQL to pro procedure and from procedure to SQL and to optimize our program. However, however, this function is still not the most optimal function here. We can because we are trying to show. A for loop example here, but we can totally avoid using a loop here. We can totally avoid this loop here. So what can we do? So 
So the set here is using aggregation, because they are constant numbers. We can naturally think about using the aggregation operator count to count the number here. So instead of having the loop here, what we can do is we can We can select we can select the count directly into into the variables here. So we can totally avoid the loops here. So uh, as you can see, we can have exactly the same result. So you can always think about where should you put the logic in? Should you put the logic in the procedure part, or should you move it? or just do it with SQL statements when you design your function. So this is uh, an example of handling query results. And, and Postgres is very, very powerful. It allows us to dynamically generate queries. So it's very similar to, to some programs uh, to some other programming languages like Python. For Python, you have the uh, ev evaluate uh, function, right? You, you, can you can execute a string as a Python statement, as a Python program with the eval function. And for Java, you also have reflex re reflection, which means that you can dynamically generate the program you would like to, to execute. And for SQL, we have for PLTD SQL, we have the same thing here. So the keyword here is execute. We can dynamically generate a string that is treated as an executable SQL statement and execute it. So the example is like this. So we can we can we can just use some custom strings and execute that constant string as a, uh, as a statement. However, we can also dynamically generate these strings and with string concatenation uh, operators. So this allows us to change the behavior of the SQL query dynamically. And this is very, very powerful. However, you should also be careful about this because if you allow users use and user input to be executed, it's very very dangerous. And SQL injection could happen in this in this case. So if the user just just do, do something like delete everything from a table or drop every table inside the input, you may end up in some disasters. So you sh this is very powerful, but you should be very very careful about the usage of dynamically generated queries. And let's have a look at an example of the dynamically generated query. So we are reusing the previous table, the employee table. And we are re kind of reusing the function here. So instead of counting the well-paid uh, well uh, employees, we count something here. And we can allow the user to specify that thing to be counted. And as far as that attribute is larger than the value provided. We will, we will count it in and return the final number of counts. So what we can do in this function here is we, can, we need to dynamically generate the SQL statement here, because we want the user input to be part of the, uh, the, the the, uh, the, st the query statement. What we can do is we can try to execute 
the, this, is, this is our previous finally optimized version of SQL query. So we can put it into a string and we can concatenate, the, we can insert the, 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 the user input as part of the string and uh, we, are generally, we are generally doing is the same thing as our previous, as in our previous example here. So, but this time we are using the execute and we are using some dynamically generated string. So, for example, here uh, we can specify the attribute to be salary and uh, the execution sequence would be we are inserting this, uh, we are inserting this salary as part of the as part of the SQL statement here, and it is, and this string here is executed as as if it is a statement. So, so we can we can also specify the attribute to be queried as uh, EID. So we, this time we can count all the we can count all the employees whose employee ID is larger than two. So the behavior of this of this program is as as expected. So we we can we can flexibly determine which attribute we should count for in this case. So because we can dynamically change the query to be executed here. So this is the behavior here. However, we are uh, running out of time here, but but you sh you can play with some something else here. You can play with let's say what what if I put this into into the string here. So what if I put this um, an um, into the the string there? So what will happen? You can try it out on your own device. You can try that out. And there are a lot of interesting behaviors here, but but in general, what you should keep in mind is that it is very powerful. Sometimes you may need to integrate uh, user-defined variables or inputs into SQL statements, but but you should be careful about this because the user can input anything. There is a there are potential SQL injections uh, in this case. So in practice, you you should be careful about using dynamic queries. And uh, that's all about today's lecture. And if you have any questions about assignment one, you can always come to the help session. And we, we won't give you the answers, but we will try to solve your problems. And uh, you can also post on the forum. And good luck with your assignment.